Hello there and welcome to What's the Point? A question we should all be asking ourselves and the podcast by brand architect Bill Ellis that will help you discover, clarify and live your purpose. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to What's the Point? And I'm excited because this is our first episode of the new year 2022. And my guest this week for this episode is one of those people I've talked about from the beginning that you may not know, but you really need to. And that's my good friend, friend Grant Miller. Hi, Grant. Hi, how are you? Happy New Year. I'm doing very well. Uh, Thank you for your time. And and I'm looking very much forward to this episode. And for those listeners that don't know you, and there's probably several, uh, Grant and I uh, have become friends through mutual uh, involvement in the Go-Giver movement. We're both Go-Giver certified coaches and certified speakers. Uh, We share a little bit of uh, history in our lives of some, some rough times that we've been able to navigate uh, not together, but similar path. And frankly, he is just a guy who is really interesting. He's a uh, top performance coach. He is an author. His book is going to come out early next year. He's actually busy writing it right now, and he's carved some time for us. So thank you again for that. And I just really look forward to getting to know more about you and, and how you've come to be where you are. Thanks, Bill. I'm excited to chat with you today. It's really good to be connected. Yeah, I agree. So let me just kind of throw a a softball up to you, if you will. Um, You accomplished something that many people have dreamed of accomplishing, and that was you had become a bona fide millionaire by the age of 30, which is which is an incredible accomplishment. However, that that may not have been the end of that story. Enlighten us, will you? Absolutely. Uh, I was I was lucky enough to be involved in uh, an internet startup in the late, mm. very late '90s, right during the tech boom. And uh, it was a software company that was creating an internet services division in Denver. And I was hired as their head of customer service. They headhunted me away from my job at Charles Schwab, where I had a nice, secure, high-paying job, and. <laughs> Uh, I took a huge salary cut, um, but they found me right when I was getting a little bit disenchanted with the big corporate world. They gave me a huge salary cut, but I took a ton of shares of pre-IPO stock. And the company okay. was backed by Sequoia Venture Capital, who backed Yahoo and Google and the big tech companies of that day. And uh, I was super excited. I showed up to my my first day on the job. We didn't have an office in Denver yet, so it was at this um, colleague's apartment. And so very <laughs> different than the big corporate situation at Charles Schwab. And I said, hello, I'm your new head of service. And they said, great, we have no clients, so you're also our head of sales. And I said, <laughs> no problem, what are we selling? And they said, we don't quite know yet, but uh, we have a software program that's a learning management uh, enterprise level software program that helps enterprises manage learning. And we want to create an internet platform to create e-stores, which was new language to me back then, um, mm-hmm. to, help, um, to help thought leaders create uh, products online and courses online. This is late 90s. And so I said, great. And so we went out and we recruited our first 100 beta clients. And um, we developed a product that was pretty popular. We uh, had some good clients. They were happy. And uh, we went public a couple years later uh, in early 2000. And, uh, you know, this is uh, – we, so suddenly we were in a, a super cool uh, office suite that was architected to mirror the look and feel of our website. It was so cool. You walked in. Felt like you were walking into the way our website looked. I had a foosball table in my office. Uh, you know, they did dry cleaning at the office, haircuts at the office, car detailing at the office. This was back in the late 90s, though, long before Google was doing all this stuff. So we were really outliers. Um, the people in the office building looked at us funny because we showed up in holy jeans and tennis shoes. Um, we were really, really early in that movement. Uh, and we all got rich, frankly. You know, suddenly Porsches and Ferraris were showing up in the parking lot in Denver. And it was heady times and very exciting. And I was miserable. 
I was just yeah. miserable. And what happened is at Charles Schwab, I fell in love with leading teams of people who were serving consumers. And mm. at this internet okay. startup, I was running more technical support people who were helping other businesses. So it was much more business to business service and sales. And it was very technical. And I was not expected to know all the technical stuff, but somehow I had created this situation in my head where I, I felt like an imposter because I didn't know mm -hmm. half the stuff that was going on technically. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was uh, disconnected to the work. I felt like I was pretending to be somebody I wasn't because I kind of was. And uh, I was miserable, just miserable. So um, anyway, that's the part about how I got to be a millionaire. Um, the stock price, um, I had 16 cent uh, strike price on my shares. Stock price went up to 60. And uh, boy, it was it was fun times. Uh, and then all that's, of a sudden. That's a nice lift. Yeah, it's a nice, <laughs> it's a nice lift. And suddenly, hey, they, let me stop you yeah, for a quick yeah, second, because I think it's really important to point out here, Grant, that from the start, uh, you've been a high performer. And, you know, so you had advanced really well through um, through the corporate world. And then you got into this startup world, which was foreign to you. And even though your heart wasn't in it, as it turned out, you were still uh, one of those high performers that helped that stock go from 16 cents to $60. So I, I think that that's a real key element of who you are that I just want to make sure that we set the stage for early on. So Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I would agree with that. At that time in my life, high performance meant high achievement. Mm -hmm. um, so high performance was not connected yet to fulfillment. And right. uh, at this place in my life, I was looking for high achievement to feel better about who I was, um, mm -hmm. to validate my value, um, and um, to be willing to face the world. So um, there were some holes I was filling early on that I didn't know yet. Uh, I, I didn't know quite what I was up to, but it did culminate in some high achievement and some workaholism, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had it made and uh, the rest is history, right? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so go on. I interrupted you. No, Please no continue. problem. Uh, so right around the time that I was feeling very disillusioned, and by the way, when we went public as a company, that exciting startup mentality about um, you know a meritocracy became more mm -hmm. of a bureaucracy. And um, things really started to change around the company. We had to account for every penny we were spending, little things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we had to account for all the time uh, we were taking, all the hires. We had to get approval to hire people, you know, um, and normal, good, sound public company policy. But mm -hmm. it started, things started to get boring again, and, and I, I was pretty disillusioned, but I had a lot of money. So once in a while, I'd go for a weekend trip and, 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 and go to a party in a different city. And have a good time. I'd buy some last-minute flight deals. This is very early on the internet where you could get really crazy cool deals. If, if you got them, bought a ticket on a Thursday and you were willing to go anywhere on a weekend. Mm -hmm. And I guess they're still available to some degree. Uh, so um, I'd go to a little party here and there. And um, by this time, I, I had been drinking, drinking pretty heavily my whole life. Um, but by this time, the drinking was getting a little out of control. And then the year, um, New Year's 2000, so what is that exactly? 22 years ago, um, almost exactly 22 years ago, um, mm -hmm. I was in a hotel suite uh, at a big party and um, I had been drinking quite a bit and somebody introduced cocaine into the room and uh, I tried it for the first time and man, uh, I, I fell in love immediately. It was, mm -hmm. it was just love at first sight. And um, I, these parties that I went on every weekend, the, the Friday started, the party started on Friday now, and sometimes it would last until Monday. And then I'd leave mm -hmm. town on Thursday, and maybe I wouldn't get back until Tuesday because I was quote unquote sick. And very quickly, uh, my life devolved. Unfortunately, um, when, when you have ready access to lots of funds, um, you can go downhill very quickly because mm -hmm. your bills will start getting paid. So your family doesn't notice that you're not paying your bills. Your family doesn't notice that there's an issue. You can hide things pretty quickly. Um, but I wasn't able to hide from my boss because my boss got tired of me not showing up to work. And after a few very kind 
uh, reminders and warnings, they asked me to leave the company. Mm -hmm. And um, for a long time, I, I claimed that I had retired at 28, a millionaire, which sounded much better on paper. <laughs> and, you know, I, I had the attitude, well, I don't need to work. Uh, so I'll spend, the, I'll spend the rest of my life uh, just enjoying this money. I'll, I'll, I'll invest it, build it up to more. And, um, you know, now it's time for the real party. Uh, so, so luckily work was out of the way. I was able to party full time, uh, took a full time party, uh, position and, uh, three months into this new party position, I decided I needed to call to exercise more shares, um, to sell more shares so that I could mm -hmm. continue to fund my lifestyle, which at this point was, um, excessive to say the least. Yeah. And, um, I called to exercise more shares and they said, Sir, um, your shares have expired. You needed to exercise your shares within 90 days um, of leaving the company um, per the contract, oh, which, of course, I hadn't read or even thought about. Yeah. And I lost over a million dollars um, in that moment. And my response was I hung up the phone and said, all right, guys. And there were plenty of people in the room. As you can imagine, when you have that lifestyle, you have lots of friends. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, guys, time to sell the BMW. And uh, that was my heavy reckoning, and I continued on from there. So um, that's how I made and lost over a million dollars before I was thirty. Well, it's it's unfortunately not an uncommon story, um, and you and I both have enough people in uh, our own experience. I I didn't get to the point of the million dollar loss, but uh, the impact of choosing a lifestyle that's not necessarily a, a positive one can be great and it affects a lot of people, but where it gets really important. And let me, let me just interrupt myself here real quickly, because what I want to point out to the listeners, and it's going to be in the show notes, uh, Grant has made a YouTube video telling this story in more detail and it's so powerful and it's so important. Um, we're not going to take the time in this podcast, but I will put it in the show notes and urge you all to go listen to, I think it's 11 minutes, maybe 12 but it's a story that you should hear because it's not just about Grant. It might be about one of us. It might be about someone in our friends or family network, but it's a powerful story. So Grant's YouTube video on, on the, the, the dark side of his history will be in the show notes. Um, the, the impressive part and the high performer part uh, started to evolve shortly after that when you were uh, I'll say rescued or at least assisted and loved back to sobriety and loved back to a more normal way of life. And there's no better way to put it than that. Uh, but you started then uh, from uh, over a millionaire by 30 to a $9 an hour job as a real estate receptionist. Yes. How, how did that work? So um, <laughs> I, when when I finally, um, you know, when, 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 as you say, I was loved into recovery, um, and I love, uh, I love the way you say that because it's so true. Um, when that happened, I assessed my life. It was the year 2008. And, uh, I thought, you know, I've always wanted to be a realtor. It had always been my dream, um, because I loved the idea of being an entrepreneur, self-employed, serving others, serving consumers, who I really love that consumer level service. And I had never been willing to quit whatever high paying jobs I had at the time to take a huge hit and take a huge risk and uh, give up that income. And mm -hmm. so in 2008, I thought, this is fantastic. I have nothing. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have no money. I have no income. Yeah. And, and the, the real estate market can't get any worse. So I'm starting from the bottom. The real estate market starting from the bottom. Um, I was living in a storage unit at the time. And uh, <laughs> uh, I had read a book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent by Gary Keller, who uh, founded Keller Williams Real Estate. So I knew I okay. wanted to go to Keller Williams. And uh, at the time, I was working at Applebee's as the world's worst server. And uh, I went to Keller Williams and I said, look, I'm reading this book. I want to be a realtor. 
I, I'm working at Applebee's and I'm a terrible server. Do you have any job I can take just so I can get near real estate and start to learn it? And I got a job for nine bucks an hour at the front desk. And I'm very, very grateful for that beginning because from that perch, I got to watch the successful agents and see what they did. And I got to watch mm-hmm. the not so successful agents and see what they didn't do. Um, mm-hmm. And I learned so much in that in that position. That nine dollar an hour uh, work. And I really, when I look back now, I realize I was paid hundreds of dollars an hour because I learned so much in that position. Yeah, free a free education, if you will. And and so a lot of points I want to make here to the listeners, and and just to reiterate them to myself. Um, being open to learning and and the way you just stated that is nine dollars an hour cash but hundreds of dollars an hour in knowledge and learning and free education is is again just a terrific way to look at things and frankly a smart way to pursue a career um you know when you say you were the worst uh uh server <laughs> in the history of of uh weight staffing uh for the listeners, uh, Grant and I met in person for the first time at a go-giver meeting in Florida, and that evening we went out to dinner with a small group. And I can tell you, I don't, I don't know if it's as a result of that or just because of the person you are. The way you treated the entire wait staff at a very busy, crazy night when we walked in with a party bigger than they were ready to handle said a lot about you and your character. So uh, that did not go unnoticed. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you were, uh, treating the, the wait staff as opposed to being the wait staff. <laughs> uh, so another thing that you'll hear those of you that go and, and watch, uh, Grant's YouTube is getting away from, uh, getting treatment and, and recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction. The biggest gift we get, frankly, is freedom. And we find a freedom that we never knew. And so in in a roundabout way, uh, you were gifted the blessing of being put in a position where you could pursue what your heart always wanted you to pursue. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because this this podcast is all about finding, uh, discovering our purpose and clarifying it and then being able to pursue it and understanding that it evolves and grows just as we evolve and grow. And so from, from that point... Your your purpose shifted from being a high performer, high achiever of stuff to being a high performer and a high achiever of helping others. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I made a very clear connection uh, around, around the process that needed to happen really to save my own life, um, that I needed to get real in the most deep ways. And then I needed to share that. So, um, you know, in in recovery circles, sometimes we say going from me to we. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it is certainly a big theme uh, in my book. Uh, but really understanding that I need to become a part of this life thing, this community thing mm-hmm. um, to survive. So from a selfish perspective, but also because sharing and, and you know, sharing what I've learned or what what piece of my journey might help another person um, is really why I believe I'm on earth. So I, I found, as you said, my purpose uh, and, and it hit me on the it hit me on the side of the head really hard. But I found it. <laughs> yeah, those two by fours can hurt. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so this, this brings us to another point of our connection. And that is, you know, we talked about you becoming a millionaire and then your focus kind of shifting. And what I want the listeners to really embrace here is. At no point did you determine that making money was a bad thing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But folk, having a different way of going about it, and that's what really ties us together is our belief in the in the philosophy and the principles of The Go-Giver, written by John David Mann and Bob Berg, two tremendous uh, mentors in both of our lives. Yes. Um, and, and I just want to make sure that point comes across because yes. you are um, – back on a, I'll say, a, a healthy financial uh, footing, yeah. but it's from the perspective of providing value first and then uh, reaping the, the rewards financially and otherwise. So, yeah, I, I think that's a key point to make. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I would say that 
Um, I would say that I earned the money the first time around by adding value uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but I, but it was in a bit more of a selfish way. And uh, the value was, was, a, I, I was, it was just enough value to get what I wanted. Um, it mm-hmm. wasn't an abundance of value. And this time around, you know, as the, the law of value states, you know, I, I aim to give more value than I take in payment. Give more in value than I take in payment. And, uh, you know, that really means making sure that I over deliver and that I have a keen sense uh, about how I can add value in this world. And, uh, you know, as I took that downward slide, um, I was just taking, 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 taking from, from mm-hmm. this world. And I was getting exactly what you would expect you get when you take, take, take from the world. And so, um, yes, I love to uh, receive, which is the fifth law of, of uh, the go-giver. But right. I, I'm happy uh, to receive and live a beautiful life and, um, you know, enjoy a few silly toys that, um, to some might seem really silly, but to me, I deeply appreciate because for a long time, uh, my life was not, not so pleasant. And, yeah. and so it's nice to have those comforts, but it's not because, um, I've been taking, it's just, it's just value and it just, it works so well in life. It's so much more fun to live this way. Yeah, and and it, it's you know so that again it, it's it's um, go giver one hundred and one where where Bob Berg if you know him at all has said more than once that shifting one's focus from getting to giving is not just a nice way to live it's a profitable way to live, and that and and the whole print the the five laws of the go giver uh, that's why the first is giving value and the last the fifth is receiving being open to receiving, so. Yeah, one of the things that you have described yourself as, and and I'm going to read it just to make sure that I don't uh, misstate it, is um, getting tying this back to real estate is you're able to build a heart centered career helping others find safety and shelter, a place to call their own. Um, expand on that, please. Well, uh, you know, spending some time without a home. Um, you know, spending some time on the streets, frankly, uh, mm-hmm. I developed a, a more, a deeper, a deeper appreciation for how important it is to have a place to close the door and be alone. So we don't think about this often, but when you're homeless, you're actually almost never alone. And if you're an introvert like I am or any human being that needs to be alone for just a little bit, mm-hmm. um, it can be uh, traumatic to say the least. To never have the moment to have privacy or just have a little peace that is, is your own yeah. safe space. And so I connected that deeply when, when I started working with clients, understanding that even people at more comfortable levels of society and, and people who are buying homes still need that very sacred space to know that they're safe, uh, that they can grow as they need to, or that they can contract as they need to. You know, that they can hold their loved ones close when things are difficult and have a safe space to do that. So in my career, I've spent time doing that in real estate. Um, In my nonprofit work, which I also consider part of my career, um, Mm -hmm. I'm also involved in um, an incredible organization in Denver named Urban Peak. And there I'm on the board and we serve youth experiencing homelessness. And these are youth that um, might have um, exited their family homes um, at, at the end of, of foster care um, and now have nowhere to go. Or they've mm-hmm. been asked to leave because they've come out as LGBTQ. Um, a number of reasons why these youth are not um, housed currently. Mm-hmm. But it's been really cool to, on the nonprofit side, to also be a part of, of that process, um, a part of finding home for people. And uh, it's, it's been a cool, it's been a really cool mission that's so much bigger mm-hmm. than just real estate. Yeah, and 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 they again it ties together, but from a different perspective. And a key point I think to make is because, uh, frankly, I've never been truly homeless, but uh, we both know countless people that have been. Um, no one that I've ever met has decided. You know what I want to do? I want to be homeless in my life. I'm going to give up everything I have and go live on the streets. There are always circumstances, and and there are people that can say, you know, just 
pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And those are people that have never faced uh, adversity, in my opinion. Uh, so the fact that you're in a position to effectively and willingly help people in that situation is truly admirable. And, and I just I, I admire that. Well, I would say that a key point to make here is a lot of times the people that say pick yourself up by your bootstraps have faced adversity, but often don't recognize the privilege that they've had um, that might have helped them out of the situation. Um, and, and I'll give you a simple example, just very briefly. Um, you know, I had a family that loved me even when I was pretty unlovable. And didn't give up on me when I was missing from their lives for literally years. And then they had the ability um, through their own privilege to be able to fight in the justice system for me and fight in other ways for me to help save my life when it was time. And so there's a lot of privilege there. Um, that I just want to recognize. And, and my feeling about privilege is when we have privilege, I think it's important that we recognize it and then that we share it. And so this work mm -hmm. is just me sharing that privilege. I have friends yeah. that I've seen come out of prison and unfortunately they didn't have families to love them. They didn't have a great place to land and they've been in a cycle for the 14 years that I've been clean and sober. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen. So um, I'm grateful for that. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. I agree. And the the comment you've made about privilege, what I, my addition to that is I don't feel any of us should be guilty about whatever privilege we have. And so there, currently there's a lot of talk of white privilege, and I experience that. But there's also um, good-looking person privilege. <laughs> there's, sure. yeah. uh, you know, being raised in a certain place, being privilege. born in the U.S., privilege. and that being born in the U.S. is a huge privilege. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Being born in the U.S. It, it, just by itself. But I just don't think we shouldn't feel guilty about it. I just want to re reiterate your point that we do need to acknowledge it. And what that means is uh, there are some battles people face that I haven't had to. Um, and and that's that's what privilege is all about, in sure. my opinion. Absolutely. So your your nine dollar an hour receptionist job has led to you now having your own real estate firm in uh, Denver and, and with sales, I think, throughout the state. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think I'm getting a, a, giving away private information here. I believe that you've last year or uh, or this year have. Uh, had over $65 million in sales of real estate. So you've become very successful in the real estate business. Uh, and I bring that up because I, I don't want to make this a real estate uh, yeah. uh, podcast either. But I think it's important to, to point out that uh, your commitment to providing value in a heart-centered way has yielded terrific results for you. Yes. And it can for others, too. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. In your business, you mentor a lot of agents that come to you and a lot of people in the industry, and that has led to you realizing what, uh, how fulfilling it is and, and how skilled you are at coaching. And that's kind of where you're turning your, a lot of your focus now. Uh, share with us uh, how that all is going, because you're you're a high performance coach. You do one on one coaching. You're developing group coaching models, and your whole intent is to, is to help others to progress through life. Absolutely, I'm here to help others grow, and yeah. that means so many things in so many different venues. Uh, I you mentioned you mentioned that I have my own real estate company. What happened when we got locked down? Uh, for COVID the first time, mm -hmm. I decided, oh, no real estate is going to happen for the next six months to a year. We're done. And um, I was wrong. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> However, yeah. um, I hired a high performance coach. And um, this was a person certified by the High Performance Institute. And the reason I chose that coach is the High Performance Institute has done the lar world's largest personal development study about what makes high performers high performers. That was the number one reason I wanted a high performance coach. The second thing that attracted me was high performance is defined by the client. What high performance means to the client 
and is um, high performance in the way that supports our relationships and our wellness. So it's not about peak performance where we set everything aside and grind like crazy and the rest of our world goes to hell and we, we uh, achieve success. This is about fulfillment and it's about uh, you know true rounded success. And so I hired this coach. I loved it so much that the third session in, I said, okay, I need to provide this for people who I'm coaching. How do I become a high performance coach? Mm-hmm. And what I realized, the big uh, aha I had is that the realtors that I've been coaching, I've been giving them tools and tactics and, and telling them what works for me. And then I realized they don't have, in some cases, the personal development, the high performance habits to support those tools and tactics. So they're going out into the marketplace and they're going to lunch with their clients, like I suggest, but they may not have the confidence or the passion or the personal power or the courage Mm -hmm. to show up as they want to at lunch. So the impact Mm -hmm. is different than somebody who shows up excited, enthusiastic, and passionate about what they do. And so I started doing high-performance coaching with agents in our brokerage. And uh, I found, as you said, I I found, you know, your your podcast is about purpose. I found the point. Uh, I really Mm -hmm. found the point. I love um, you know, watching that growth happen in other people to the point where I realized that I love coaching so much. I don't love owning a real estate brokerage so much. Uh, so I, I came to my own kind of shift and realized, wow, I really want to build this coaching thing. I love coaching my real estate clients mm-hmm. and I really love coaching um, agents and, and really people from all walks of life. I'm now coaching a tennis a tennis guy. Uh, a tennis pro, which is really fun. Uh, yeah. But what I realized is I don't love owning a brokerage. So I actually made that shift. And um, just a couple of months ago, we closed down the brokerage and I joined a larger shop where I can focus on being a realtor and being a coach. So it's really, it's really been a big life change for me, as you mentioned, but it's exciting. Yeah. And, and uh, so congrats for, for that realization. And, and part of, you know, we talked early on, Grant, about the, the thing with purpose is that it evolves and it grows. And what we have to do to really be most true to ourselves is to be open to seeing where that takes us and having the courage to follow that new, uh, that new evolution. So a lot of people say, well, I've changed my purpose. I don't see it that way myself. I see it as evolvement. I see yeah. it as growth. Yeah. And, and so that's, you've done that throughout your story. Um, and I, I hadn't realized, frankly, that you'd closed your brokerage, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I, I knew there had been a change. I just didn't understand it. Sure. But the, the coaching, um, talk a little bit about your one-on-one, but also what I want to talk about uh, or have you talk about is something I know you're just so excited about, and that's what you're in the midst of creating, and that's group coaching. Sure. Sure. So my one-on-one coaching is, uh, in high performance coaching, it's 12 sessions. So I meet every other week for an hour and we go through 12 sessions in high performance coaching. And unlike a lot of life coaching, uh, this is, is, um, is prescribed. So there are 12 sessions. Each session has a topic and we talk a little bit about updates, a little bit about accountability. Then I actually teach a little bit about whatever topic we're talking about, usually about a high performance habit. So it might be clarity, courage, physiology, psychology, different pieces of of what makes a high performer. And we do a little teaching and then we do some work together. When we will go through a worksheet together or through some action together um, during that call. Super powerful. One thing I was noticing is when I would talk to somebody and I'd hear them have an incredible moment of, of genius, you know, people say the most amazing things during these sessions. And I would think, holy cow, I wish so-and-so, who I'm also coaching, could have heard that. And I mm-hmm. wish that they could, because I can express it, but this person really gets it. I wish these two people were together in this session. And so I'm designing a transformative community coaching program where and we're going to really dig deep. There will be some online learning component so that we're all starting from the same place. 
Um, but then you'll come in and join or leave as you need to. It'll be an ongoing program. And my goal is to make it a truly transformative process. And then we'll get together in person when that's safe. Um, once or twice a year to really have a culmination weekend uh, and really go even deeper. Uh, but I'm super yeah. excited about it. Well, the the key to that, uh, first of all, it's a brilliant idea. And I, I, I have found that working with groups can be a lot more, uh, not just rewarding to me, but beneficial to those people in the group. And what I like about uh, the concept and what I see in you is that you bring what I think is uh, a strong message of an example of trust and safe haven, safe harbor, if you will. And that's critical to to having a, a group uh, like you're talking about, yes. is where people can start to feel comfortable. So I think that's a real good starting point, and I'm excited to learn more about how that goes. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a book earlier, and, and you're 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 actually uh, closing in on the last chapter of at least the rough draft, if not the final version of your book, which is called Top of Heart. Yes, and that just put a big smile on your face. So yes, I'm excited. Uh, I'm very excited. Um, I I literally I, I just got off a call with my writing writing coach, and uh, and we we talked about where I'm at right now. Um, I have one chapter left to write. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure where I was because we have uh -huh. a 32-page book blueprint. And um, I must say that I have an incredible writing coach. Um, and she helped me create this blueprint in the beginning. But as all blueprints happen, things change as you go. And uh -huh. uh, I'm, I realized – I looked up and said, wow, I'm one chapter away. I actually decided I needed to get out of town. I was four chapters away. And I needed to get out of town just to have a different experience and to really lock myself up. So of all places, I'm in Vegas. Um, it's my writer's cabin in the woods. Uh, but yeah. but I, Which makes perfect sense for someone that, that's been known to enjoy a party weekend or two. There you go. That's exactly <laughs> right. And it's so ironic. Um, I just finished writing uh, my epilogue. And I say how ironic it is that I'm sitting in this suite at the top of this building um, and just really um, blessed and lucky to be living this crazy life. And I remember some very different times in Vegas that I talk about in my book. But, uh, but the book is about creating real, meaningful, emotional connections with our fellow mm -hmm. human beings. And I'm focusing mostly on salespeople and entrepreneurs because that's my experience. But I think mm -hmm. we all need that deep connection. And if We've learned nothing else during the last couple of years. I think we've really learned how important that is. Uh, so top of heart is is taking the familiar top of mind model. So mm -hmm. to know you, like you, trust you, and just go one step further. So from no like trust to head, hands, heart, uh, which mm -hmm. is a different mindset, building yeah. a personal development skill set. And then finding a new heart set, as I call it. And heart set is all about this concept that, uh, that you just brought up, where we create a super space, safe space for each other. We allow each other to be who we are and be safe in that. We accept each other as we are. By the way, um, this is a practice, not, um, mm -hmm. not a perfection thing. And, I, and then to give each other what psychologists call unconditional positive regard. So, mm -hmm. Bill, when I'm with you at lunch and you're my real estate client, I allow you to be who you are. I appreciate you for who you are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I pretend to like you if I don't. That's okay, too. It doesn't mean yeah. that I pretend to, to not be disturbed if I am. That's all right. But at, my, at the core, if we can allow each other to be who we are, the irony is – that's when the most change in a positive way happens. And so I believe that's the greatest gift we can give each other is to be seen and heard as we really are and then accepted that way too. Um, and as I said, it's aspirational. It's, there's a lot of work that all of us um, have to get to that place. Yeah, and I, and I love that. So there's a big difference and, and I think a big, not hurdle, but certainly something that we ought to be aware of, 
there's a big uh, difference between acceptance and agreement. Yes. We can accept someone else for their beliefs yes. and not have to agree with them. And yes. I think that touches on what you're talking about. So people, you can now go right now to topofheart.com and pre-register for announcements about the book and uh, become part of the launch team, which I'm sure is coming in. And uh, topofheart.com also will be in the show notes. I'm going to shift gears on you just a little bit because... Uh, I know one of your recreational or one of your, uh, I don't want to call it a hobby, but you're quite the equestrian. Yeah. <laughs> you like jumping horses. I do. I do. It's a crazy thing, isn't it? I guess I found another way to do something dangerous, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I've ridden since well, I was it, a kid. It, yeah. I've ridden, I was just going to say yeah. that, that it's really cool to see because it, it's the smile that's on your face right now. So those of you watching YouTube, the, the whole camera just lit up from the smile when, when we mentioned equestrian. But it, it's just really cool to see you pursuing something that is unique and uniquely satisfying to you, whether it's dangerous or not. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, tell us about your equestrian and how that came about. Uh, I have always loved horses since I was a little kid. There was no reason for it, no introduction to it. I saw a horse in a book. I think it was Black Beauty, and that was it. I was obsessed. It's other than my parents, it's the longest love of my life. Um, and so uh, I rode. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have access to stables or anything. When I was in middle school, I went to uh, some stables and offered. We didn't have money, so I offered for me to ride. So I offered to clean stalls in exchange for lessons. And I ended up working as a what they call a working student all the way through high school and um, went to apprentice with a Canadian equestrian team member in Canada right, you know, the, the couple of days after I graduated high school. I came back to Colorado. I turned pro. And um, then I realized, I had realized during that process, I was riding 14 horses a day that were clients' horses, and it wasn't fun anymore, and the love was getting mm -hmm. sucked out of it. And they really realized that it wasn't the way I wanted to spend the rest of my life. And so I stopped riding for a number of years. Um, then during the internet startup, when I had money again, I rode for a bit. Then I lost the riding again for obvious reasons. And so the last five, four or five years I've been riding, I bought a horse three years ago. Um, his name is Zarko. And um, he is just incredible. And here's the thing about purpose that's funny. The other day, I had one of those, you know, you jump maybe a dozen jumps once a week. You really limit how many jumps you do to protect your horse's legs. And um, I jumped a jump, and the way that he jumped, is, it's a long story, but it was just so powerful. And we landed, and I stopped, and I looked at my horse trainer um, teacher, and I said, that is why I was born. That was the reason I was put on this earth. And so, you know, we've talked a little bit about purpose and how I have this higher purpose to serve others and add value and, and try to do some good in this world. And I think that that high purpose is, it's high minded. It's, it's very much my purpose and it's very true. Mm -hmm. And I also have learned from that experience with the horse that, you know what, something trivial and silly that really doesn't add any value other than to me and the horse in the world is mm -hmm. also my purpose. And that's okay too. And so our purpose doesn't always have to be focused uh, on these, on these big topics. Sometimes they can be these beautiful moments when we sit down to play the piano um, or, uh, you know, or, or do something that's solitary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was something I hadn't understood about purpose until that very moment when I said that. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you that, first of all, that's a brilliant observation, uh, one of many you've shared so far today, so thank you for that. But I, I can tell you that that, that was very self-gratifying from your perspective, but it does matter to others because when I see the postings you make of you and Zarko and the accomplishments and the pride and the joy and that smile of yours, which is blinding me at times, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it touches others' lives. And, yeah, and it, it to me, sends the message of, pursue what really excites you because it really excites you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to tie your equestrian back to your real estate in this regard. 
you took a job cleaning stables so that you could learn from professionals and to learn about horses. You took the receptionist job to learn about real estate. That's a big lesson. That's a that's a that's a very admirable and and uh, perspective that a lot of people overlook. A lot of people, in my experience, want to come out of college or come out of trade school or just not come out of you know do whatever, and they immediately want to be like you, a, a millionaire by the time they're twenty one or thirty or whatever the case might be. But going about it where the way you have, where you're so open to learning and you are so teachable. And my first sponsor told me in recovery that uh, remain teachable. And that's probably the best two words of advice I've ever gotten. Uh, and and um, so you you not only have taken those jobs, which some people would turn their nose up at, because you had a different perspective. You saw that they were learning opportunities without having to pay to go to school necessarily. Um but you also have mentioned so far, I want to say that I've heard you mention at least three different personal coaches that you have, if not four. I, and so I, the remaining yeah. teachable is, is powerful. That's true. And I counted it the other day because I had a coach. I had a coach who's trying to sell me on, on joining his coaching program. And so I said, no, absolutely not. I am so full in on learning I'm, i've got my plan and i have no space mm -hmm. and he kept pursuing me and so i finally counted and i have eight different coaches in my life um one of them is a, a horse coach one of them is a, a you know is a wellness coach um and then the rest are business coaches uh and mm -hmm. um to learn different pieces and that includes our incredible mentor uh, bob berg yeah but uh but absolutely i am a little bit I'm a little bit of a learner, which is ironic because I really struggled through formal learning at, at school. Um, so yeah. I, it turns out I'm a, I am a learner. <laughs> well, I, and it's a great example. So uh, one comment that you made before we started recording is, and it, and it speaks to what you just mentioned, the number of coaches and that you don't have uh, bandwidth for more, is you're at a point now where you need to quit taking in so that you can turn around and start making that output of your group coaching and your high performance coaching and that. So I, I think that's really an, an important part is knowing when to say, okay, the learning is great, but I've got to do something with it. So we've talked a lot today. I, I want to honor your, uh, your time constraints. I know we're right up against it. Uh, but everything from uh, huge financial success huge valley of uh, of a horrible path that you have since recovered from, uh, finding what fulfills you and, and pursuing that and how you help others. We've talked about a whole lot. So at the end of the conversation, here's the question every guest gets. Uh, Grant, what's the point? <laughs> I think really, truly, uh, very clearly, the point is for us to connect with each other in deep, meaningful ways. And in, I should say in every way. Um, life mm -hmm. is so much richer when we get to experience it together. Uh, whether you love music or you love watching football, I'm sure you don't want to sit in a stadium alone and watch Adele sing or watch the Broncos play. It wouldn't be the same. And life is like that. It's so much richer when it's shared. And uh, I really, truly believe uh, that that's the point, as long as we're also having a ton of fun along the way. Yeah. Well, I, that's brilliant. I expected nothing less. I agree with you 100%. And one thing I would love for us to share in the future is, if, if it were ever to be possible, I'd love to be in a, an auditorium or anywhere with you and just to hear and see and experience Dolly Parton, because I know oh, yes. that's another one of our connecting points. We love that's that right. woman. Yes. And, and, and so I'm going to put that on my manifestation list and, and maybe we'll get that uh, sometime soon. Grant Muller, thank you so much for your time and your insight and all of the information on how to get in touch with this brilliant man and, and this heart centered man will be in the show notes. Uh, topofheart.com, grantmuller.com, and all of the social media and everything else will be in the show notes. Grant, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Bill. It's been really fun. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We can promise you'll gain value in every one. 
Rating and reviewing makes us more discoverable and helps others find out what's the point. And if you'd like to know more about Bill Ellis or contact him, please visit his website, www.brandingpillars.com. See you next time.